Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our fourth Your Co-op Live event. My name is Ollie Watts, and I'm part of the East Living Co-op team. Very pleased to be hosting this evening's event with you all. Um, we are pleased to be coming to you live from Worcester Park, which is the home of the East of England Co-op. Uh, and we've got some fantastic guests um, and uh, we'll be talking to you this evening about a very important topic around planning uh, for end of life. I'm very, very pleased uh, this evening to be joined by Rachel Dawson from Ellison Solicitors, Hello. Joanne Burrows, one of our funeral coordinators, and Hello. Evelyn Rutter, who is our bereavement counsellor. Yes. Hello. Hello. Um, so we've had a fantastic response um, to this evening's event. Um, we know there's lots of you watching this evening and it's an interactive event, uh, an event with an opportunity for you to ask lots of questions. So we've had lots of questions submitted in advance. You'll see along the side of the screen an opportunity for you sub to submit questions this evening. So please do that. We will certainly try to get through all of the questions this evening, but do bear with us because it has been very popular. One of the first things we're going to do this evening uh, is kick off uh, with a poll just to get the conversation started. So you will see on your screen now uh, a poll, a question which you can ask. Uh, when did you last review your last will and testament? So please do feel free to vote away uh, and give your thoughts on that, um, that topic. And as you'll see throughout the course of the evening, the questions will pop up, other questions from from other viewers will pop up. If it's a question that really matters to you or you want to, to vote on, you can click a thumbs up uh, and just, you know, give your give your like to that question that lets us know it's, it's popular. So lots of people have contributed to that. Uh, I think very interesting to see most of the people who are watching this evening uh, saying that they don't actually have a will, wow. which is quite interesting, <laughs> I think. It is interesting. It is interesting because um, obviously it... I, it is important to have a will, and we'll talk about the reasons why yeah. as, you know, as we, as we chat Absolutely. one another. Yeah. So does that fit with your experience, uh, Rachel, with the clients that you see when they come to talk to you about planning for end of life? Yeah, so often we'll get calls you know, to say, I haven't got a will, where do I start? Mm -hmm. That's usually the first you know, point of call, really. Yeah. Um, other clients will say, you know, I haven't reviewed my will. I had to speak to somebody today, you know, 30 years ago. Yeah. Generally, you know, it's a good idea to review your will, maybe every five years or so, because legislation can change, circumstances can change. Um, it's good to check your assets. You know, if you, if you, you know, house prices being the way that they are increasing at the moment can change your inheritance tax position. So there's lots of reasons really as to why it's it's a good idea to regularly review your will. Yeah. Thank you. So I think it's interesting to see, yeah. you know, how people are approaching it for now. I think yeah. what we're going to do as well is we're going to go um, to questions uh, immediately yeah. because we've had a lot of questions for you. I think people Have are really you? keen to get the benefit yeah, of your Yeah, there's been lots experience. coming in, isn't there? Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. So I think we'll go for, for our first question, uh, which yeah. has had a lot of, lot of sort of likes and comments. Yeah. How can I protect my property from future care costs? Yep. Yeah. So that's one that does come up a lot, actually, um, in, you know, with my clients. Um, the best way and the most legitimate way to protect your property from care costs would be through a will, actually. There is a type of will that you can do that allows you to ring fence your half, your half share of the property mm -hmm. um, so that if the survivor of you goes into care, then only their half of the property would be used to fund their care. Okay. So the example would be, you know, husband and wife, husband leaves his half share of the property to his wife, mm -hmm. um, what's called a life interest, so she can use that interest and enjoy the property for the remainder of her life. But if she were assessed for care, then actually she would only own half of the property. Okay. Um, and that's the way that I always recommend mm -hmm. that clients pl um, plan for okay. care costs, really. And I assume that planning yeah. for care costs is a topic yeah. that's been on a lot of people's minds. Yeah recently yeah it is and it's really important to people you know people take different views on it mm. you know some people really want to make sure that they maximize their their estate as much as they can so it's not used in care others might want actually the funds to be available so they've got unlimited funds to fund care um it's just personal to the yeah. individuals really i think it's yeah. good to know there are options available there yeah particularly as it's such an important topic at the moment exactly. if we go to our 
yeah. our second question, and, and yeah. that question, um, I think, again, lots of people are obviously very interested in. Yeah. Are online wills legal, or do you need to use a solicitor? Yeah. So technically, yes. If you, you know, if you make a will, um, and you know, it's. I'm not going to say it's not legal, but it does have to be signed properly mm -hmm. and witnessed properly, um, and people doing it themselves. So often it does go wrong. Mm. You know, they might not have it witnessed properly and it, it might not be dated. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that um, I see quite a lot is um, the testator, the person that's made the will, their intention hasn't been made clear mm. within the will. You know, they might say one thing in one paragraph and they're saying another in the next paragraph, which then makes it very difficult mm. for the executors and the families to figure out exactly what the intention was. And it can end up causing problems and actually the estate more money yeah. than if they'd maybe just paid for a professional will to be drawn up in the first place. So it is, it is important to go to a professional to get your will drawn up, really. Yeah. Thank you, that's help, very helpful. Uh, another question here uh, about inheritance tax. Uh, my will leaves everything to my three children, grandchildren and future grandchildren. Um, Inheritance tax is a very complicated topic. Obviously, we're not going to go through yeah, the vagaries. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to give you. Yeah, you don't want to have sort of a whole seminar tips on inheritance for, tax. Tips yeah. for inheritance yeah. tax planning. I think the best way useful. to tackle that question is just to speak generally about inheritance tax. So everybody has an allowance of three hundred and twenty-five thousand that they can leave that's free of inheritance tax. Um, on top of that, if you are planning on leaving your home to your lineal descendants, that would be your children, grandchildren, stepchildren. Um, as long as you're doing that, you would qualify for another 175,000. That is dependent on how much your estate's worth as well, but I don't want to get into all of that. Um, if your um, spouse, so if, you know, if a husband passes away and leaves everything to his wife, then his unused allowance can also be applied. So again, that's another scenario where the situation would be good for them to get some professional mm. advice because they would need to check that you know, their assets, the way they want to leave the estate, what happened with both parties involved um, would need to be, you know, looked at really to make sure that they would qualify for those allowances and exemptions that can apply. And presumably that changes quite frequently. It's not something that's written in stone for years. It can change with... Yeah, well, it has changed. Policy. I mean, you know, it's been the same for, for a while, but I mean, who knows mm. what... <laughs> <laughs> who knows what legislation is going to be Absolutely, brought in. Yeah. So, but at the moment, that's the way um, the inheritance tax thresholds and, and allowances are. Um, right. and, and that's what we'd be working with. OK, thank you. Uh, OK, our next question. What are the rules on joint ownership when one person dies? Can surviving spouse change their will? OK, um, so basically it is important to check how you own your property, because sometimes you can own a property whereby in a way that if one of you passes away, it will automatically pass to the surviving owner, even if you've got a will leaving everything to the cat's home, um, you know, the, the property will pass outside of the terms of the will. So it's important, again, to check that um, when making a will to make sure that you change the ownership of the property so that you own it in such a way that your half share of the property does pass by the terms of your will and not by what's called the survivorship rule instead so again it comes i sort of feel about going back to that point again and again and again you know all of these things mm -hmm. are something that you would discuss with your lawyer um, when making a will to make sure that your wishes can actually um, be carried yeah. out absolutely yeah it's a complicated area it absolutely is absolutely yeah. um okay uh, next question uh, is a handwritten will valid and does it require two independent witnesses signatures yeah so that comes back to what we were saying earlier really doesn't it so Technically, yeah, you can handwrite a will. Um, I wouldn't recommend it necessarily, um, you know, and yes, it all, a will always needs two independent um, witnesses and it needs to be dated. Um, and can those witnesses be anybody? Is there a particular requirement about who they should be? Or? Yeah, so they need to be independent witnesses. So it's really important that it's not someone that's going to benefit under the will mm -hmm. because their gift could fail if they, if they witness um, the will. And it is best practice that it's not an executor. Right. Um, and it really should just be someone completely independent and mm. not involved. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Thank you. Uh, our next question about power of attorney, mm -hmm. um, which I know will be of interest to, to lots of lots yeah. of people. Yeah. I would like to set up both for myself. What is the best way to action this? Yeah. I'm unsure about doing this myself. Yeah. So again, um, you know, technically you can do it yourself. I'm not going to sit here and say that you can't because, you know, technically you can. But again, it's, it's an area that it, I would recommend you go and get proper mm. advice because 
you've got to be comfortable with the scope of authority that you're giving to these people as appointing them as your attorneys. You know, you're giving them a document that's going to give them the power to access your bank accounts, even sell your house on your behalf. Um, so we, you know, we have steps that we take to make sure that we, you know, protect our clients to make sure they're not under undue influence or um, they've got the right capacity to enter in it. And also, um, you know, with the Office of the Public Guardian, there's a very strict order of signing. There's things that they don't like, that they will just throw the application out when you try and register it. Um, and it's, I think, really important to get that right. Mm. Sometimes people make them get them signed, but don't get them registered. Mm. And then they go to get them registered when that person's lost capacity. Mm. Well, by that point, it's very difficult to put it right if you're mm. trying to get that document registered. So mm. it once again, it comes back to that point of if you do pay the money um, to see someone to get it done properly, then it might save you more money in the long run. Because mm. if that person does lose capacity and they haven't got a valid lasting power of attorney, the alternative can be yeah. quite expensive. And um, given the topic of the conversation, yeah. receiving power of attorney is yeah. one of those yeah. one of those things that's difficult sometimes to talk yeah. about, I yeah. imagine, but really yeah. critical. Yeah. You know, you often need it. You know, absolutely. Need it, can need it quite, quite quickly, I absolutely. And, and so many people say, well, I'm OK at the moment or they're OK mm. at the moment. They've got their facilities. But the most important thing is that somebody, you know, has capacity when they make that document. Mm. Um, because if you've lost that capacity, then you can't enter into that document. Mm. And we all think that the loss of capacity comes later in life, which, yes, it often does. But I've had clients in the past. Um, there was one pe set of people that I can think of that... Um, a lady had fallen down the stairs and was in a coma um, for mm. several months, for six, seven months. Mm. She was very young, actually, and her husband couldn't access her finances for mm. all that time. Um, COVID has shown us yeah. um, that the unexpected can happen. Mm -hmm. You know, so many young people have been, you know, in comas um, mm. for a long period. So that need for a lasting power of attorney does go beyond mm. being elderly mm. and, and, you know, developing dementia or, mm -hmm. you know, those types of things, really. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, our next question, which I think relates to sort of property ownership, which we touched on yes. um, earlier. So yeah. my husband and I are tenants in common on our property. Yeah. Please explain what would happen if, uh, if when we or either one of us passed away. Yeah, so tenants in common is the type of um, ownership whereby your respective half shares would pass either by the terms of your will mm -hmm. or by the, what's called the intestacy rules, which is um, the rules that apply when you, you die without having a will. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to look, see if we've got any other questions here because we have quite a few questions on, on wills. But it's very, <laughs> yeah, clearly, your, your advice is very well sought after, which is, which is good and impressive. The, the level of detail, so yeah, very impressive. Helpful. Thank but, yeah. you. Um, uh, could you explain what a power of attorney can mean? I think that could be quite an interesting thing to, to talk about. Yeah, so um, there are two types of powers of attorney or lasting powers of attorney. There's one that deals with your property and financial affairs, and the other that deals with your health and welfare decisions. Um, they both need to be registered with the Office of the Public Guardian in order to be used. The health and welfare would only be used in the event that you lost capacity, even if it was registered, because, you know, really, you should be making those decisions. Mm -hmm. um, it does basically what it says on the tin, you know, it, it gives someone the authority to deal with your health and welfare decisions, you know, where you'd receive your care, etc. But another great thing about the health and welfare lasting power of attorney is it gives you the um, opportunity to give your attorneys the authority to consent to or refuse life sustaining treatment on your behalf. Mm -hmm. So it's not like a do not resuscitate you know, document. It's basically gives you the opportunity to sit down with your family and say, right, in this scenario, I wouldn't want life sustaining treatment. In that scenario, I wouldn't. So that basically, let's say it was your children, mm -hmm they would be the ones that would be able to make that decision for you instead of leaving it up to the doctors. Yeah. You have the opportunity to leave it up to the doc doctors as well within the document, but it, again, it gives it comes back to that control Absolutely. Um, and planning, yeah. which is obviously what tonight's all about. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. definitely. It's a key theme, I think. Yeah. And we'll hear it when we, we talk with some of the rest of our, our, our guests is that yeah. that control and having that conversation earlier, I think, is really, really critical. Yeah. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll see if we can take one, maybe two more questions That's based on fine. the time. I can't being, believe how many there are. Lots of questions, are. which is really good. Yeah. Um, I think we'll go with uh, this question about will my house have to be sold if I go into a to a care home? That's quite a tricky one, really, because... Um, that's quite hard to answer generically um, because you have to sort of look at that on on the circumstances. Um, 
because there are so many factors um, that have to be considered, mm -hmm. like the age of her son, um, yeah. whether she's going to be local authority mm -hmm. funded, whether she's got other assets. So that, unfortunately, I'm afraid that's quite a difficult one yeah. for me to answer. Understood. Yeah. Understood. And yeah. we'll take, I think we'll take one more if that's yeah, OK. Yeah, so um, can you stop anyone changing the will after you've died? I hear so many people fight it afterwards and, and win. OK, so there's um, two sort of bits to that question, really. So. I'll start with the bit about I hear so many people fight and, and win. Um, people, so there are certain people that they have to fall within a certain class um, of what's called, you know, claimants that can bring a, try to bring a claim against an estate on the basis that they feel that the person hasn't made what's, you know, reasonable provision mm -hmm. for them, um, which again is a reason to get advice because yep. If you are someone looking to um, exclude someone or make limited provision for that person in your will, mm -hmm. then there are things that your lawyers can do to try and protect your state, estate as best as possible right. um, you know, in the event that a claim was issued. The other half of the question, can, can people change the will if the beneficiaries are in agreement, mm -hmm. all in agreement, or, or sorry, in relation to your share, actually, I should say, you, you can, within two years of death, um, do do a, um, enter into a document that can change it. But I don't think that's what that person was asking. I think they were more asking, okay. you know, could, could someone change the will in, in because they don't like what's in it? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's the answer. Okay. Really. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you so much. Those yeah. are some really interesting questions and, yeah. and very helpful responses. Detailed I think, questions. Indeed. I think yeah. one of the things I've, I've learned from that is, given that the majority of people responding to our poll yeah. said they hadn't got a will. I think it just shows yeah. how it's important to get that sorted. It affects yeah. so many aspects of the topic of what we're talking about yeah. today. So yeah. thank you so much. Oh, it's and, pleasure. Uh, we'll come back to you later, I'm yeah. sure. Excellent. So um, we're going to move on to our um, our second poll um, now. So um, the poll, which will pop up on your screen, uh, next question for you to answer. Have you spoken about your funeral wishes with your loved ones? So please vote away now and that will help us. Uh, get into our next conversation. It's really interesting seeing these questions uh, and answers coming in live. So um, give everybody just a little bit longer now, uh, a bit more, a bit more balanced than our previous question, which is interesting to see. So I think what we'll we'll leave that there. I think so. Um, Going to introduce our next guest now, um, Jan Burrows, who is our funeral coordinator with East of England Cop Funeral Services. Thank you for joining us this That's evening. Okay. Really Thank good you. to have you with us. I think it's interesting to see the mix of answers here. Mm. So we've got a really good split between the people who voted of, who've never talked about their funeral wishes uh, and a good chunk of people who've discussed it within the last yeah. 12 months. Be really interested to get your you know, experience as a funeral coordinator. Yeah. What happens when a, when a family sits down to talk to you? Is this something that is a topic of conversation regularly? Well, yes, it can be. It, it can vary quite a lot as well. When um, I have families come to see me, some, some families do have never discussed with mm. their loved ones um, any of their wishes and it can be qu quite, um, can make for quite an awkward conversation as well. So when, when I'm talking with my families, I, mm. I tend to try and be as open and honest as possible if they're coming to see me about um, putting plans for mm. the future. Um, or if they're actually they've lost a loved one yeah. and they need to make you know some decisions, yeah. we often will have a chat and find out what their loved yeah. one's wishes were if they did express them. Absolutely. Um, so it, you know it is always a good idea to have yeah. a conversation because often or not you've got a, a very distressed family mm. already, um, and they you know they need some guidance because they don't know what they would like yeah. for their loved ones. And it's a difficult conversation to have as a family at that point when you're you're bereaved and coping. We're going to talk about yeah. bereavement a bit later, yeah. but a difficult conversation to have. Yes. One of the questions I've got, we've got lots of questions, but mm -hmm. just thinking about what you've you were saying, what if you had to start that conversation mm -hmm. you know, with with your family, what's the best way into that conversation? It's always it, it's always very difficult because it depends on how the families communicate with one another anyway to start mm. with. Um, often or not, I find that um, these sort of conversations usually start with the loss of a loved one mm. 
already so um, it is very difficult and sometimes once you find that you do sort of enter into that conversation things do flow mm. and you're, you're more comfortable with talking about that you know someone's passing yeah. um, so the more that you do bring it into your conversation it it just makes it a lot easier to talk about and maybe then you could discuss your wishes with mm. not like to be buried, cremated, the person who's going mm. the type of person who's going to take the service. Yeah, so Okay. Thank yeah. you. Excellent. Well I can see over at the corner of my I've had lots of mm. lots of questions here and obviously the role of a funeral coordinator is very <coughs> broad. So yeah. we've got some questions from the audience now. So I think if we go to our first one which is what is the most eco-friendly way of conducting a funeral? Right, okay. I mean, obviously there's two types of funeral that you can have, which is either a cremation or a burial. Um, both have their advantages um, for burial or cremation. Mm -hmm. Obviously, um, the, the trend nowadays is cremations um, purely because of mm -hmm. the the lack the lack of room now in cemeteries as as probably a lot of people are already aware um so often not if we're looking at an eco funeral the sort of things that we'll be looking at is um the type of coffin choice um already with a, an eco funeral with cremations and that they have to at the crematoriums they they have to come to certain standards so that they have to monitor their admissions, things like that. So, you know, you could have an eco funeral with a burial as such, as well as cremation, depending. So there's lots of options. So there's lots of options, really, yeah. Okay. But often or not, the, the main choice, main thing it's down to is the coffin choice, Absolutely. really. OK, thank you. And we, we, we talked about cremations just, just a moment ago. Mm. Next question is about um, whether or not there are any restrictions and where you can scatter ashes. Right, okay. Um, generally, the, the, main, the main important thing to remember if you want to scatter your loved one's ashes is technically you should get permission of the landowner. If you own the land, then that's absolutely mm -hmm. fine. But if it's a case of um, some a park, that sort of thing, generally it's considered that you should mm -hmm. seek permission okay. first. So yes, you can scatter wherever you like, okay. but you should really seek permission first Absolutely. from the landowner. Absolutely. And are there any, one of the questions that springs to mind when I hear that, are there any any um, locations that's, that are unusual from your experience in, in, in working with families when, when they do this? Where's I've, the most sort of I've heard many place? stories, really. Um, often or not, sometimes um, they want to take their loved loved one back to their homeland yep, yep. so often they will mm. they will take them back to mm. say wherever they originated <laughs> from um some we've had in at the sea mm -hmm. um popular ones around mm -hmm. this um, location is yeah. near the Orwell bridge yeah, yeah, yeah. um so there's there's various different options yeah. but also there is the option of like local crematoriums yeah, yeah. um cemeteries mm -hmm. churchyards yeah. um you know, so there, there is various options, but if often or not, if it's the case of scattering a loved mm -hmm. one's ashes, it's usually what their loved one's wishes were. Yeah, absolutely, which is important. So, which is important. Given the topic yeah. of what we're talking yeah. about today, to have exactly. that conversation, because it may be a location that perhaps you wouldn't imagine that is in their mind that, yeah. that matters to them. So yeah, I'm, yeah. Know. So often or not, it, 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 it can vary from family to family, but normally they have quite a good idea. Mm. Um, both our crematoriums and most crematoriums offer it like a gardens of rest, mm -hmm. which is somewhere that is not so much marked. However, mm -hmm. you know, they get the option to, for somewhere for the family yeah. to visit afterwards. Okay. So it depends right. what their wishes are, really. Okay. Thank you. So we talked a little about cremation. Next, next question is about, about burial. Can I be buried legally in my garden? Well, yes, technically you can. You... Um, Providing that the landowner agrees, mm -hmm. yes, you can. Um, you do have to um, also gain permission um, for this. Um, providing everything, all the paperwork's in place, there is no reason why you can't, mm -hmm. but it often does require a check with the um, local water authority mm -hmm. to make sure that they're not imposing on um, any drainage or anything like that. Okay. But yes, it can. Okay. However, for like, further burials in mm. the garden then there is some okay. other issues and you might have to seek planning permission okay. so it's it's a little bit one would be fine mm -hmm. but two may may cause you a few issues okay. 
Thank uh, you. But I've never come across that okay. yet. Well, it's interesting. It's been a question for this evening, and, <laughs> and lots of other questions. Just a yeah. reminder: there's an opportunity to, you know, still ask questions. If you have a question that's prompted by any of the conversation um, or answers yeah. or things we discuss, then please do do submit away. So, mm -hmm. next question is also on, on burial. So, if I decide on burial, would I need to reserve a plot at my local parish church prior to my demise? Okay, that's something that I haven't come across before and generally uh, any churchyard or a cemetery, local cemetery, they don't reserve plots okay. that I've come across. Um, also, it possibly isn't the, probably the best financial decision to make, yep. um, depending on you, sort of your age and your health, mm -hmm. because if anyone is, yep. you know, when, if you purchase these, uh, often not there is a lease on mm -hmm. them and that will start running as mm -hmm. soon as that's purchased. So yep. from that point of view, it possibly isn't okay. probably the most beneficial thing to do at the time. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So ne next question just changes uh, topic a little bit and okay. I think re reflects some of the changing trends I think we, uh -huh. we see when people are, are planning funerals. So uh, when I die, I do not want a funeral or any of the trimmings. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the rules for getting my body from place of death to crematorium? I'm just reading that again. That's Sorry. okay. That's right. right. We will take the body from the place of death to crematorium. Okay. I, now that one might, I might have to pass on that one just a little bit. I know that there's, it's often quite um, a, a trend now, mm. especially since the COVID because mm. of the restrictions mm. around attendance mm. for funerals, um, that um, the direct cremation mm. now is quite a popular choice. Yes. And often or not, we find that families, um, they prefer that option mm. and have a celebration at a later day mm. and rather spend that money on remembering their yeah. loved one rather yeah. than, um, you know, spending it on yeah. vehicles. Yeah. And I think it's an, it's an interesting trend, isn't it, yeah. that, that we see such a breadth of people, breadth of approach. We have lots of, lots of people who go for a, a more traditional funeral, as yeah. you'd expect, and lots of people who use that as an opportunity to to remember in another way. Yes, yes. So often or not nowadays, we do find, and, and you'll be very surprised um, of quite a few people's wishes just to have a, a basic direct to cremation or direct yep. to burial um, yep. funeral rather than having the service attached. Yep. Absolutely. And, um, you know, use, using those funds for other, other for memories. Other things, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, next question is about woodland burials or burials at sea. Um, do we do we arrange those and how easy are they to arrange? OK, so I haven't dealt with them within my time as a funeral arranger. However, I know that they are possible. Um, there is some local facilities in the mm -hmm. Essex area from what I can gather. Mm -hmm. um, but they can be arranged. And if it's certainly something that we've never come across in branch, mm. which sometimes does happen, yeah. we do have other experienced yeah. arrangers that will be able to help with that. Yeah. And we'll find out all the details. Yeah. So. And I think that's the interesting thing from having had the pleasure of working with yeah. you and your, your colleagues for yeah. quite a while now, the breadth of things that, that can be organised yes. To, yes. To, to remember somebody yeah. are, are incredible. Yeah, I, just to, an example for today and something that I'd come, I hadn't come across before, a colleague, got in contact they were contacted by a family and they wanted a milk float wow for a hearse and I, 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 I made a joke about it saying you know no never heard of it no 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 never heard of it it mm. transpires that that actually yeah. um, was arranged at my branch many years before me and so again there's mm. there's a wealth of knowledge out there and again so. again to think back to what we're talking about today the opportunity <laughs> to have that conversation you know, a few years prior to, to yes. the event happening gives you an opportunity to plan, you know, and, and, and time often in these scenarios is, is helpful, isn't it? Yes. So yeah. and you may be surprised by what the person's considering. Yes, yeah, yes, definitely, definitely. Absolutely. But yes, the milk curse is a new one on me. I've come done a motorcycle one. That's yeah. that's quite an interesting one as well. But Fantastic. Yeah. That's very, very unique. Um, next question um, about um, funeral planning sort of in advance. How do I lay out plans for my funeral so my family don't need to worry when the time comes. OK, well, there's something that we do in Branch and that um, that is quite freely available. We, mm. we offer um, funeral plans and those are at different levels um, according to mm -hmm. what someone would like um, 
for their funeral service. So that's often a very, a very good way to open up any discussions yeah. with families as well, because with ours, um, there is the option to add in quite a bit of detail. Yep. So things like whether or not you'd like a religious or non-religious mm -hmm. service, mm -hmm. the type of minister to take the service, mm -hmm. um, even down to how if, if how the mood will be on the day, yep. relaxed, informal, mm -hmm. formal, funny, yep. that sort of thing. Um, and also, you know, so it gives you the opportunity mm -hmm. to put in quite a lot of your own personal choices i.e maybe that there's a particular piece of music that you want to play in mm -hmm. that sort of thing yep. so it, it's very it's a very useful tool to mm -hmm. open up conversations as well as making some decisions in advance and of course the the beauty of a funeral plan is is once that's paid that that is locked in mm -hmm. at, at price yep. so you know if you were to sort of mm -hmm. um live for 20 30 years that yeah. You do you do sort of gain Absolutely. on that because it locks those prices in. Yeah. Um, I think it's reassuring to think or think of the conversation we've had so far and the legal aspect of it and the funeral planning aspect of it. I think it's reassuring yeah. to know that both can be organised in, in when there is time to have those conversations. Yes. Yeah. And organised in a way that gives you some reassurance and security that And some that control things... as well over, you know, that because if you've got your wishes written down there, it gives the family as well. Mm. It, it takes that pressure off them mm. when, you know, they're grieving. Mm. Um, so often or not, it's, it's, it's a useful tool because a lot of the work has already done for them. Absolutely. So it takes that pressure off. Thank you. Great. I think what we'll do is we'll take uh, one more question. And okay. we've, had, we've had quite a few, which, is, which okay. is, uh, shows how much interest there is in the topic. So, uh, and this might actually cross the boundary between both okay. of you actually. So in, <laughs> right. my, in my will, I've stipulated I want to be cremated, but my daughter hates cremations and wants me to be buried. How can I be sure my wishes will be carried out? I think that one might come to you, Rebecca. Well, um, really, funerals are just an express wish mm. um, in a will. They're not legally binding. Mm. Um, so I don't know how that ties in with the funeral plan, actually, yeah. um, to be honest. Um, to, be, to be fair, yeah. um, in most situations that I've come across, we, we go with the wishes of the family and we, mm. we are at that point of an arrangement, we mm. appoint mm. Um, what we call a client, so one member of the family or a friend, it doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. have to be a family member. Mm. And um, it's them that we would then entrust to make those decisions. Mm. Um, so that person is the person who would mm. sign any relevant paperwork with regards mm. to cremation because mm. there is paperwork to be done mm. with mm. a cremation and that person would have to yeah. sort of answer some questions to make sure that there have been no objections. And yeah. I think, again, that really shows the importance of having that conversation, yeah. yes. however challenging yeah. it might might be. To yeah. try yes. and I mean, determine these things. It's so in terms of the will, it's the executors that've got responsibility for arranging the funeral. Um, so I guess that's you know appoint executors that you think are going to carry out your wishes, yes. mm -hmm. and is probably the best sort of way to approach that yes. if it is really important to you. Yeah. yeah. So I think you'll find there's less there is less paperwork involved with a burial than there is with a mm -hmm. cremation. So if say for instance a family come to mm -hmm. me and they've expressed the wish that they want their loved one for cremation, mm -hmm. then there is certain paperwork that they have to fill in mm -hmm. and questions and a statement of truth they have to they have to sign mm -hmm. um to say that there's been no objections from any family members okay. that mm -hmm. sort of thing okay. so it generally is covered within that that they're, they're telling us the truth that that they, is the you know the deceased person's mm -hmm. wishes so mm -hmm. great okay yeah. well thank you for that thank you for your That's perspective right. on it as no, well it's very, no. very helpful <laughs> yeah um, thank you. so th th thank, thank you very much for that some fascinating questions about about funeral services and um, after the event, you'll um, be able to find lots more information on our on our website. Our funeral services team provide a really wide range um, of services um, to families across our region. Um, and what we're going to do now is just play a short film to tell you a little bit more about them and, and the services that they provide. My name's Sandy and I'm the funeral director and funeral arranger here at Wimpole Road in Colchester. We make initial contact with families who are bereaved and we discuss and help them through those first stages right the way through to the final funeral service. I love my work in the funeral service. We're able to help and support people throughout the most difficult times from start through to their funeral 
with ad advice and empathy and support. And that brings me great comfort and joy myself. Hi, I'm Liv and I'm Senior Marketing Manager for East England Cult Funeral Services based here at Worcester Park in Ipswich. We support local charities and projects from sponsoring local football teams and hospices to supporting events like Daisy Day which helps people across the region commemorate the loved ones that they've lost. I love working for East of England Cult Funeral Services because it's great to be part of a business that gives so much back to the local area. As well as supporting communities through donations, grants and sponsorships, our colleagues are often in attendance at events in our communities including making tea for guests at Suffolk Remembers and taking part in community litter picks. Hello, I'm Wayne. I'm the coffin supervisor here in Ipswich. I fit coffins, I line coffins. It varies from coffin to coffin. We do veneers, solid oaks, all the way up to a mountain caskets. I enjoy what I do. I try and help the families out as much as humanly possible because they're at the lowest of the lows what they can ever get. My role is to support people, listen to them, help them to understand perhaps why they're feeling the way they are and let them be themselves, let, let them tell me how they're really feeling in a safe environment. It gives me such great satisfaction to be able to say that I have actually helped somebody. I see people, they come, they sit on my settee, they are in great distress and after several sessions they go away and they smile and they feel as if a weight has been lifted and they say thank you ever so much and I know that I have done my job really, really well. Uh, my name is David Proctor and I am a funeral director and embalmer here at the Ipswich Chapel Arrest. I was training for about seven years in total to become an embalmer. The personality come back, the, oh that's Nan, comes back, things like that. And hopefully gives the, the families a better experience whilst coming to the, the Chapel Arrest to visit their loved one sometimes is a, a big, big relief for the, the individuals to then see that person at, at peace. Anything that may be left unsaid can be said. The ability for those family members to maybe come in and say their, their last, last messages, last, last thoughts, I think it makes a big difference for those individuals. So I hope you found that video interesting. Um, I had the pleasure of working uh, with the funeral services team for almost 10 years now and every time I learn or have an opportunity to watch a video like that it always amazes me that the people that we have and the care they they provide is just just incredible um, so I hope you found that as, as interesting as I did um, we're going to talk to our, our, our final guest um, this evening in, in a moment um, and we're going to talk about uh, an important but very difficult part of uh, you know discussing end of life which is uh, grief and, and bereavement everybody deals with grief and bereavement very very differently um, providing and finding support during that time is really critical so I'm very pleased to introduce um, Evelyn Rutter. Evelyn is a bereavement support counsellor um, with our funeral services team. Um, Evelyn could you just start by telling us a little bit about the role that you do um, as a bereavement support counsellor? Thanks Ollie. Well, there are two roles actually I run um, bereavement support groups for um, any, any person, not necessarily just co-op clients, but for a bereaved person. And the second part of my role is that I'm a bereavement counsellor, and that is for our clients. So the bereavement support groups in Colchester, I have, I have one in Colchester, Clacton, Malden and Mitham, and my colleague Rebecca has four groups running in, in the Suffolk area. So, and then the and I, I also do the counselling throughout Essex and Becky does the um, counselling in Suffolk. Okay. Thank you. Right. So we, we've had quite a few questions on this topic as we have right. had okay. throughout the evening for, for, for all of our guests. Mm -hmm. And just a reminder that as we continue the discussion, please continue to, to add any questions that you might have or, or, or like, you know, um, tick um, with, with the thumb icon any questions that you think are particularly relevant to you. And what I think we'll do now, Evelyn, is just take some questions from, from the audience. So as a, as a starting point, um, how can I help my friend who is going through a bereavement? Well, basically, just by being there and sitting alongside her, walking alongside her, listening to, the, to, the, to her story, because every bereaved person has a story, mm. and it quite often goes from... It, from before the person becomes ill, and then ill, then the person dies. And 
it's a it's a journey that mm. you will help your friend through. Absolutely. Okay. And I presume a key part of it is is, is listening and, Absolutely. And, and and listening to some of the things that are unsaid as well as the yes. things that are said. Yeah. It's very difficult because the person is your friend not mm. to try and give her advice mm. or him advice, but it's something that we can't do. Mm. That person has to experience the, their own their, their pain mm. to actually walk through that mm. dark woods or the tunnel to actually find the light yeah, at the end. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We'll go on to our second question. Mm -hmm. um, and I know we mentioned, certainly when we were chatting beforehand, you know, bereavement and, and grief presents its way in, in different ways with different people and at different times. So our second question is about if I'm still grief stricken after a year, is it, is it too late to seek help? Not at all. It could, could be too early for some people, but a year is probably the best, the best time to start. Mm -hmm. Maybe six months. It depends on the, how the person died and your relationship with mm. the person. So it's very much an individual decision to make. Okay. Thank you. Um, so our next question, um, a, a, very, a very challenging topic um, around um, the death of, of, of a child. Mm -hmm. um, so could you tell us a bit about the support that, that you provide for parents or families of, of, of children who've, who've perhaps... Uh, a neonatal death or baby loss during pregnancy, mm -hmm. um, as this has an effect on on a number of a number of people. You know, one in four pregnancies is the stat that's quoted in the question. Right. Well, um, we do have a child loss group in the Suffolk area, but not in the Colchester area. But what we do, what I do for people, I either refer them to Suffolk, mm -hmm. or I will say, well, there's other organisations that will be able to help you. Yeah, yes, absolutely. I think that's. Sorry, Evelyn. Go on. I was going to say it's a very very delicate mm -hmm. subject. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Of course. And I think obviously anybody who is, is going through that, there are lots of other groups that can support you. Yes. Um, it's really, there is lots of support out there. It's a, a terribly challenging yeah. scenario to find yourself in. It's, it's quite often difficult to find the groups, but once you do find them, there is help there and that makes you feel a lot better. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so our next question, uh, does the bereavement support team visit people in their homes? It's a difficult question. Um, we used to, but we find it's much safer if we have our group, mm -hmm. we see somebody in, in our office, yeah. or if that's not possible because of mobility for some people, we will do telephone support. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, but that's quite, not quite the same because it's much no. better to meet face to face yeah. and see the expressions on people's faces, Absolutely. the words that are not said mm -hmm. as well as the words that are said. Yeah. Yeah. And I think actually our, ne our next question, there's some similarities there. So. Uh, I was bereaved six months ago after nearly 50 years of marriage. Um, so our condolences to you. That was, that's a very difficult situation to find yourself in. What bereavement care is walkable, please? So I'm taking from that question as the person would like to walk from their yes. home to a group. Um, all our groups are held in usually in the centre of town so that people can actually get a bus and then, and then walk to, the, to wherever the group mm. is being held. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Um, our next question, how long does it take to be able to remember the deceased person in a happy way and not feel sad when thinking of them? Again, it's a very difficult question, but I think if you really have loved that person, there's always going to be moments, there are always going to be moments of sadness. The first three months, I would say a person has got so much to do as mm. far as arranging fun of the funeral, dealing with the legalities of the, f of, of the person dying. So after about yeah, six, six months a year. Okay. And I think the, the, the challenge with this is, as we've talked about a few times, it is, it is so, so personal. Oh yes. Um, I think one of the, one of the questions that, that I have is, I, certainly based on my own experiences with this, it can be difficult to see coming through the other side, but certainly based on the conversations that we, we're having in preparation for the event, it sounds like there's lots of examples where people who you've worked with, who've come to these groups and, and you've mm -hmm. spoken to one-to-one -one have mm -hmm. come through yeah. the other side and, and are you know in a better place now. People will come to the groups thinking that they're not going to be able to, that nothing is going to make this better. And actually nothing can really make it better, but they, mm. it can actually help you come to terms with it. Because, yeah. So talking to like-minded people who have lost 
a loved one. That's a, that, that's the, the beauty of the groups. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, absolutely. Thank you. I'm um, just looking at some other questions we've got here. Is there a minimum period of time you would ask somebody to wait before receiving bereavement counselling? I think so. Depending on the death of the person, the relationship of, with, with, with the person, um, three months, six months, I think that's a fair estimate. And I presume that allows the person's, some of the person's emotions to, to subside. Yes, so they to can... settle down and then they can look at life differently. They, they, haven't got, they, they can focus on their bereavement mm. and on the loss rather than trying to focus on that and paperwork and legalities. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. OK, thank you. Um, do school, school children, excuse me, I'll put my teeth in, do school children get help in schools? With they the can do, yes, but it's something that we don't do. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. It's a specialised area. Yeah. Um, okay, our next question, can I access the bereavement service if I haven't made funeral arrangements with the co-op? Um, whether I have or not, is there a cost for the counselling? I can only counsel our own clients there is no cost and, and the counselling sessions can go from one week, two weeks, mm -hmm. to six weeks to three months, depending on the person. But there is no cost. Yeah. Yeah. And the bereavement support groups that we, we offer are, are kind of are available for anybody. to For anybody, yeah, yes. Absolutely. And again, they do pay 50p for their coffee. That's fine. Yeah. But yeah. apart from that, there is no cost. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, is there a bereavement counselling service within Norfolk? Not as yet, but we're hoping that this is going to happen in the near future. Yeah, absolutely. Um, OK, and um, our last question. Um, I still struggle to come to terms with the loss of a loved one. Um, any, t any, any tips for how I can perhaps come to terms? With that? It's a difficult question to answer, I know. but It is a difficult question, but I often say to people, one of the, the best ways of coming to terms or accepting the loss is to keep a diary. Mm. And every day, write in the diary how they're feeling. Some days they might just put a great big cross through the, the, through the page, that I'm not going there. The next day, lots and lots of emotion might come out. So again, keeping a diary, talking to people, and, and to like-minded people mm. in the same situ who have been in the same situation. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Evelyn. And thank it's you okay. very much to My all pleasure. of you for your questions. Um, some fascinating questions we've had um, on a really broad range of topics. So. Thank you very much. I think we're the other thing just to mention is there will be um, a film uh, on our website about bereavement um, support that we offer. And our website will have details about all the things we've talked about this evening. If you want to uh, track down any of the information that we've shared with you. So we are now at the end of our event this evening. Um, a few things just to say to wrap up. First of all, a massive thank you to our guests this evening, to Evelyn and, and Joanne from the funeral services team and to Rachel from Ellison's. Thank you so much for uh, joining us and for answering those questions, some very technical questions, some very detailed questions. I think it just shows the range of, of topics, um, you know, it, uh, that we need to deal with when dealing with this topic. So thank you very much for your time this evening. Um, thank you very much to all of you um, who've watched um, this evening and, and for your questions and your contributions. Um, in a few minutes after the end of the event, you'll receive an email uh, with some uh, options to give us feedback via a short survey. Please do uh, take the opportunity to let us know what you've thought of this evening. Uh, we're planning to run more events like this in the future into, uh, into next year uh, and your feedback is really, really important. We're running these events for you, uh, you know, our members, so please do continue to, to give us your feedback. Um, you will also um, receive um, your, uh, your pack um, of, of goodies after the event. Um, later on um, they'll be received and we've been packing those, um, the team have been busily packing those uh, over the last couple of days and they're, they're a lovely little goodie pack so they'll be arriving with you soon um, as a thank you for attending. And I think really the, the main thing to say is, is a thank you for me for giving us your time this evening. We hope you found it of interest and we look forward to seeing you at a future event soon. Thank you very much and good night.